The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the sixth chapter of the fourth gospel. John chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 24 through 35 there this morning. Picking up really where we left off last week. John chapter 6, beginning with verse 24, reading through verse 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, give us ears to hear. Ears that hear your words that speak to us through the words of Holy Scripture. Help us to hear your words, God, and not whatever words I put in the way. So that your words may change us, may feed us, as we travel along this road, along this journey of faith to which you have called us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. His name was Stupid. Now, I don't mean he had a ridiculous name, as if he introduced himself and you went, that's stupid. No, his name was Stupid. But it was spelled S-T-O-O-P-I-D. I spelled it that way because I didn't want the vet to think when I took him up to see him after a dog fight that I was S-T-U-P-I-D. We called him stupid. He was a red chow mix who had come up in our yard one day with our German shepherd named Alex, who I obviously did not name. And for several days after school, I'd get off the bus, and there was this crazy, overzealous, matted dog who just sort of took up with our dog, running up and down the road where we lived. Until one day, until one day when I got off the bus and I did what every parent tells every kid not to do when a stray dog shows up in the yard. I got off the bus, I walked down the driveway, up the back steps of our trailer, into the house, and went and got one of our nicest cereal bowls, an old Cool Whip container. And I filled it with a couple handfuls of gravy train, some warm water, and stirred it up. And when I set that bowl down, that dog's tongue nearly knocked his teeth out trying to get to the bottom of that bowl. And as you can imagine, from that day on, that dog was mine. He never left. He'd wait for me at the back door before I walked to the end of the driveway to go to catch the bus in the morning. He was there waiting for me when I got off the bus in the afternoon. And when I learned how to drive, that stupid dog, hence his name, would run beside my truck and try to jump in the driver's side window as I drove around the house. 
I believe I could have driven off a cliff and looked in the rearview mirror, and there he was, tongue just flapping in the breeze, jumping off the cliff with me. Now, I'd like to think that that dog had some sort of affection for me, some sort of connection with me, some loyalty, you know, that, that poets write about between a dog and a boy. But if I'm honest with you, I think the real reason stupid waited for me every day after school wasn't because he sat around wondering where I was all day, missing me. It was because he knew as soon as I got home, I was going to get that Cool Whip container, and I was going to put that gravy train or that Harold Mill and Company rough and tough dog food, which I'm pretty sure was made out of some questionable stuff, and I was going to sit it down in front of him. You might say that from his point of view, at least, Ours was a relationship of convenience. He showed up, I gave him food, and he showed up every day after expecting some more. I think there are a lot of folks who are in such relationships, relationships of convenience, especially when it comes to relationships with God. Folks like those 5,000 or so who had gathered on the other side of the Sea of Galilee or Lake Tiberias, they were waiting, wanting to hear Jesus speak. Those 5,000 or so whom Jesus, like we saw last week, just fed them with a few pieces of bread and a couple of dried fish. Folks who continued to look for Jesus after he slipped away, walked out on the water to the other side of the lake, because as some of you know right now, that cereal you ate this morning, that Pop-Tart maybe you ate as you were getting dressed, what happened to it? You're already thinking right now, boy, a burrito would be really good. It goes away. Bread and fish only stay in one stomach for so long before the emptiness and hunger return. And so John tells us, or the writer of the fourth gospel tells us, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. Now why? I mean, I'm really curious about this. Why did they take it upon themselves to go look for Jesus? I mean, think about what they just saw. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to, if you had experienced what they had just experienced... Witnessing this radical rabbi divide five loaves and two fishes into enough to feed thousands, wouldn't you, if you had witnessed this, want to run back home and tell somebody? At least send them a text. Wouldn't you, after witnessing this, want to, to figure out how he did it, maybe? Run and tell somebody, look, I met this man, he took this bread, he divided it. Wouldn't you want to run home and tell people you would just witness the inbreaking of God's kingdom, the arrival of God's prophet. Because that's what, that's what this crowd collectively says back in verse 14, right? After Jesus does all this, it's not like it's a secret. It's not like they don't know where it's coming from. They said, this indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. So why aren't they going and telling everybody? Why aren't they running out and saying, look, we found the prophet who's to come into the world and then go back to find him? Why are they just setting out to try to find Jesus? Hadn't they already seen enough? Hadn't they already experienced enough to take what it was they had witnessed and tell the world about it? Why are they still chasing after Jesus? I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're a lot like those other folks. Those other people who were also following a prophet who went up on a mountain once. People we heard a little bit about earlier in the service. The Israelites who followed Moses in the desert of Sinai. I mean, think about them for a minute. Have you ever thought about that story? They had been liberated from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And they were, they were liberated not by somebody signing a covenant or something like that, because there were ten timely parables. Or not parables, plagues. And then, after they were liberated, God parts the Red Sea, and they walk through on dry ground just to look up in the rearview mirror and see the, the tanks of the day, the Pharaoh's chariots, swallowed up 
by the collapsing water. And as if that wasn't enough, they witnessed the very presence of God going before them in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And you would think those people, right? You would think those people would have said, we have seen enough, we trust, we believe, we're on the way. But no, what do they do? They grumble. Always looking for the next thing, always looking for something more, coming to Moses, asking for God to give them more. They grumble about the next thing on their list, as if they could so quickly forget what God had already done in providing liberation and safe passage. And so we heard this morning what is perhaps the most obvious sign of God's provision in the Exodus narrative. Those wandering people are given bread from heaven. To eat every day. I love that story, by the way, in Hebrew, because the word manna, manhu, just means, what is this? So you get the image, they walk out and go, manna? And then they just get stuck called that. You think they would have been satisfied with the signs from God they witnessed in Egypt. You think they would have been content in knowing that God's presence was with them, went before them, dividing the sea, clearing the path. You think these folks would have been satisfied in knowing God would provide for them even in the midst of a desert, but no, they still grumbled even after God gave them bread and meat every day. So it's not new with the people in in this gospel. It's not new with folks around us. It's as old as the people of God themselves. It's perhaps the same drive that called those people away from one side of the Lake Galilee into the boats across the sea to look for Jesus. I mean, we know that's true because Jesus calls them out on it, right? In verse 26, he says, Truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. These people weren't coming to find Jesus because they were curious about what all the kingdom of God held in store for them. They're not following Jesus, hoping to understand the deep divine mysteries of the universe. They're not following Jesus to hear him tell them one more time, listen, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The rest is commentary. They're not coming to Jesus to hear this sort of stuff. They're coming to Jesus because they're hungry. For the same reason that red shaggy dog kept showing up in my driveway. Jesus fed them once, and maybe he'll feed them again. And so after Jesus uncovers their motives, he says to them in verse 27, Look, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it's on him that God the Father has set his seal. In other words, Jesus says, Look, you all were willing You were willing to spend the night out on a hill to get up the next morning, to get in some boats, to row across the lake. Why? Because you thought you might get some bread. But these same folks, I guarantee you, probably would get up on a Sunday morning and look at their clock and go, eh, I won't go to church today. What Jesus is saying is there are folks who are willing for food, for bread, for the thing that will pass away to work their fingers to the bone, to take all kinds of risks. But if they came because they saw a sign, if they came because they wanted to know more about this power that Jesus had, that'd be something. But it's a comment on humanity to say we are more willing to work and strive for the things that don't last than we are for the things that are eternal. So Jesus, despite this crowd's culinary motivations, takes advantage of this teachable moment to guide them away from their intestinal incentives towards a deeper understanding of the divine. Don't don't work for the food that perishes. Instead, strive for the things that are eternal. But they clearly miss the point. What do they say next? It almost sounds like there's a part missing. Like like we, we came back and the editor made a mistake. They say, what must we do to perform the works of God? I mean, that's what they ask after Jesus tells them about food that endures for eternal life. What do we have to do? I mean, is there a more cliche religious question? I think it makes the top three. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And what do we have to do? What must we do to perform the works of God? 
To me, that's an intriguing question because if Jesus gives them an answer, a straight answer, then we don't need to read on. If Jesus gives them a straight answer, then we've got it all figured out, right? I mean, if Jesus gives them a list, no matter how long, if he pulled out a post-it note from his back pocket or rolled in a scroll in a wagon, it doesn't matter. Then if he gives them an answer, if he gives them a list, then we've got an answer to this enormous question. I have to believe that this crowd in John 6 asked this question of Jesus because they believe that the answer might lead to a lifetime supply of loaves and fishes. A guarantee that hunger will never again be an issue. And while the situation isn't exactly the same, I have to believe that most of us who ask this sort of question do so because we believe the answer might lead to something like a lifetime of contentment, of happiness, maybe a sense of relief in thinking about the hereafter. We believe that the answer to such a question, what do we have to do that the answer to such a question will ultimately help us parse our lives into easy to handle sections, allowing us to check off a list of God works. Uh, uh, mow the lawn, check, go to church, check, read my Bible, check, get to work on time, check, uh, pray over my dinner. If we have a list, we can subsidize our lives into easy to handle sections and just check the God works off the list while carrying on with the other parts of our lives that we seem to enjoy a little bit more. If I'm honest with you, I think it's why some of us mourn some of the old ways and old things we used to do with church, like revivals that used to last for like weeks. We mourn them because really, really what it is is we could then pack a lot more religion into a little subsidized part of our lives rather than, you know, all of our lives. Maybe. But Jesus doesn't give them a particularly straight answer. Do you notice that? There's no list, no bullet points. Instead, Jesus says, this is the work of God. Ah, oh, it's one thing. That you believe in Him whom He has sent. Now, I know to folks raised up in church, this may sound like familiar language, right? Believe. Believe in Jesus. But have you ever stopped to ask yourself what that really means? Believe in him who he has sent. Believe in Jesus. Now, for a lot of folks, that simply means some sort of cognitive agreement that Jesus was alive at some point in history and did at least most of the stuff that the Bible says Jesus did. In other words, for a lot of people, believing in Jesus is about agreeing to some factual existence of Jesus of Nazareth. But that's not what this means. What's more, it's not just some baptized passcode for getting into heaven. Believing in Jesus. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well good, you won't go to hell when you die. That's not what this is about. It's about more than a religious claim of identity. Believing in Jesus... It's about trusting Jesus. It's about trusting Jesus to do more than just serve us as some genie in the Bible. Granting wishes, answering prayers, making food out of thin air. Believing in Jesus is about having enough to believe that Jesus will do so much more than just quiet our growling stomachs. That Jesus will heal our hurting hearts, mend our wounded souls. Yes, but call us deeper and deeper into the divine mystery of God in the life of faith. Of course, we're too often and too easily distracted by what's right in front of us, right? We're so regularly confronted with today's troubles or the troubles that we make up that to think too deeply about the needs of our souls is sort of silly. To think about those things that are eternal, that can be lost on us at times. It was lost on this crowd in Capernaum. I mean, Jesus, after he tells them about believing in him, what did they say? Well, what sign are you going to give us? They're still wanting something practical. What sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they want to know. 
All right, Jesus, if we're supposed to believe in you, where's your CV? Where's your resume? Where are your references? What are you going to do to show us that we ought to believe in you? They want to know. Why should we believe in Jesus? What sign is going, are you going to give us? Our ancestors, Moses, the prophet they followed around, gave them manna. So what are you going to do, Jesus? Isn't that absurd? Did you catch that? Do you catch the absurdity of what's happening here? Jesus has just fed 5,000 or more people with a few pieces of bread and a couple of fish. And now those same people want to go, oh, yeah, when are you going to do a sign, Jesus? He just did. Don't you want to smack him? Like, don't you want to re- don't you want to smack yourself? Don't we do the same thing? Are you kidding me? Seriously, were they that ignorant as to what was going on when they were on the other side of the lake? Did they think that was a fluke, that Jesus just sort of uh, misstepped, a lucky shot, that maybe he had went to a really fine culinary school where he could make a pinch of bread and a pinch of fish look like a whole meal if he just plates it right? No. Because you know what's going on here, don't you? I mean, Jesus said, you came not because you saw signs. Jesus already knows. You know what's going on here, don't you? There are dogs showing up in the driveway. They want more bread. They don't care about a sign. Jesus, if you can make a bread truck pull up and just start handing out loaves, we believe in you. It ain't got to be miraculous. They want more bread. I mean, they bring to Jesus this example of Moses, who in their mind had made a way for them to have bread every day, not just once on a hillside. So why can't you do what Moses did, Jesus? If you'll do that, we'll believe in you. We believe Moses. Give us bread every day and we'll buy whatever you're selling. But you notice Jesus corrects their misunderstanding, right? Truly, I tell you, it was not Moses. Don't get it twisted, people. It wasn't Moses who gave you bread from heaven. But my Father who gives you the true bread of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You see what Jesus does? He does it all the time. They ask for one thing and he flips it on them. They're thinking with their stomach, seeing with their eyes. But Jesus is trying to get them to open their hearts to this reality of what's going on. This isn't about bread and fish. This isn't about food. This is about the true bread of heaven. But of course they miss what Jesus is saying. And I don't know if they got tired of beating around the bush. I don't know if it's different people speaking up. I don't know. But they get tired and they just come right out and ask for the very thing that brought them across the lake. Well, sir, just give us this bread always. We came here because we're hungry. You gave us bread over there. Look, we'll just level with you. Just give us the bread always. Jesus gave them bread once, and now they want it all the time. To never have to need bread again. To never know hunger again. To always have plenty to eat. But that is such a small part of what God is up to in Jesus. It's why Jesus responds with words fitting himself in the fourth gospel. A go a me, he says in Greek, I am the bread of life. Man, that's a powerful sentence to those people in that day. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But this isn't about bread and fish, this isn't about water. This isn't about food at all. If it was, then what Jesus offers us is little more than a religion of convenience. A religion in which God is nothing more than an owner scooping out handfuls of gravy train and putting it in front of us. This isn't about just asking us for rules to follow, the right things to do and the wrong things not to do. If it was, then what Jesus offers us is nothing more than what every other religion and self-help philosophy offers us, garnished with a little crucifixion and resurrection. This isn't about just checking a box, agreeing to some facts, some doctrines. 
If it was, then why all of this? Why all of this? Why not just put out some pamphlets? Why not just fling Bibles at people going down the road and say, hey, read that, and if you agree with it, sign up online. Here's a website. Why not? It's not about this. Because this isn't about any of that stuff. This life of faith is about believing in Jesus. The one who makes more than enough out of barely any at all. This is about believing in Jesus, the one who calms the waves and walks on the water, but refuses to be made king. This is about believing in Jesus, who though he holds the power to feed thousands and to make the world, gives up his life to die. This is about believing in Jesus enough to say, whether he does it again or not, it doesn't matter, because what he's already done is already enough. Because what Jesus offers us is not a religion of convenience, but a life of faith. A long, winding journey through dark, desolate valleys, up high, lofty mountains, through times of abundance and times of scarcity, across a diverse landscape dotted with people and places pregnant with the presence of God. What Christ offers us is not a religion of convenience, one in which we are promised bread every day. No, what Christ offers us is a way, a journey. And what Jesus gives us is just enough bread for the road so that we cannot help but trust Him, to believe in Him, to believe that He'll see us along the way, that wherever we go, We don't go alone, for the bread of life is always with us. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit, help us, God, when we give in to this notion that what we have is a religion of convenience where you are a master we serve who gives us what we need and we obey simply out of obligation. Lord, help us to see that what it is you are calling us to is a life of relational faith. A life, Lord, where we trust you We trust you because you love us and because we love you. So help us, help us, God, to take hold of that faith. To trust you along this journey, even when it winds in places we dare not go alone. Help us, God, to follow you. Even when it's rough, even when we can't. Or call us on. Give us enough bread for the road. Enough bread for the journey. The bread of life. Give us you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.